Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day and pray that you will shut us in and be with us now and that your Holy Spirit will be in our hearts and our minds and help us to understand and embrace this truth so um, we can more fully serve you and uh, serve those who need to know your truth. We ask these blessings in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Now, our first Bible verse I've chosen is Colossians 1, and we're looking at verses 15 and 16. So if you turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 15. Um, and I've, I do, as you know, look at um, Bible versions. I'm, I use the King James, but the Amplified also gives a good expanded version of that. So um, I'll be using both. So one Col Colossians 1. Verse 15 says, Who, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now the Amplified says he, which is Jesus, is the exact living image, the essential manifestation of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible. So I like the way they give you a bit more of an image. The firstborn, the preeminent one, the sovereign and the originator of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him that is by his activity and for him. So there's no um, reason why we cannot understand God and Christ and the Spirit is our one true source um, because all things were created by him and often we get caught up in our own, what we think is our creation. Oh, look what I've done. You know, we really need to look a lot more at what God has done in us, what Christ is doing in us. So it helps us to stay close and it stops us from going into things like feeling what we call a bit puffed up or a bit proud. You know, haven't I done a great job? No, God's done a great job in you. And so uh, I think this is where when we remember all things come from God, and this is where we go on having a look at receiving to give. And it says that we receive all things visible and invisible from our Creator. He gives and we receive. And I think sometimes we forget at where what we're given comes from. And all of creation comes from our Father's love through His Son, Jesus, and His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. Now, there's a really good reading that um, looks at this from Desire of Ages, page 667.4. And Ellen White says, There is no one living who has any power that he has not received from God, and the source whence it comes is open to the weakest human being. How often do you feel like you're weak? I do. I often feel I'm weak and pathetic and how can God use me? And he does, but it's not me, it's him. And this is where we look. She says that um, there isn't any power that we have that doesn't come, that we don't receive from God. It doesn't matter what age, who we are, where we are. All power comes from him and it doesn't matter. We don't need strength. We get strength through him. We receive his strength. We receive his love. She says, and this is a Bible verse she uses, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, said Jesus, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So that's John 14, 13. So if we ask and receive, it comes from God, it comes from his creation, from all creation. So it's um, a, a small reading, but it says a lot. Now, one of the things as I was preparing this topic was looking at, well, we, we learn to receive and we learn to give, or we learn to give and we learn to receive. So where do we learn that from? Where did you learn about giving and receiving? And this is where I started to look at my childhood and how we were brought up and how we were raised. Now, Aunt Nancy will relate to this, I'm sure, <laughs> because my mother and father came from the war, and dad was in World War II and a Great Depression. And they were incredibly affected by it as to what they would give and receive. I had a very, or well, we had a very thrifty mother and she hoarded what she could to survive. It was all about survival. 
So the pantry was always as full as possible. Um, everything was kept, every little scrap, every little morsel, and you never wasted anything. You always got the message, eat everything on your plate. And it was threatened that it would go to the children in India. And I used to sit and imagine mouldy food ending up in India because I didn't want to eat it all. But it was, it, and all that we had um, came from creation because my mother was really incredibly good at growing gardens and keeping chickens and we had a cow and a goat and all these different things for our needs. So really when you look at it, and I used to spend a lot of time in creation, we lived in the Adelaide Hills, and I was aware of God's presence at a very early age. I didn't understand it, but um, when you look at all of creation, when you're living in it, it's easier to connect to it. Um, so now I understand it a lot more. But really my mother was also a great giver in certain areas particularly, um, and especially to us, to her children. She liked to give, but it was about again, because she was deprived, she wanted to make sure we were not deprived mm. and it would be at her own cost. And doesn't God give at his cost at times? He gave his son to die for us. It, it cost God everything so we could receive. And so it sort of gives you a little bit of a snippet and she used to sacrifice a lot of things. In fact, I never realised how poor we really were till I was in my teens and um, got to know mum a lot more. And I thought, wow, she really, she had to do things to go beyond what she wanted to do so we could survive, whether it be staying up late at night, sewing and doing things. And um, yeah, so she could be very generous with the money, um, but mum wasn't a good receiver. I don't know if you remember no, that. She wasn't. She didn't like receiving. She'd give, 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 but never received. And that's where I thought, oh, what have I learned? And uh, if you gave mum a present, you'd get $20 back. It didn't matter what it was, she had to pay. <laughs> so, but we don't. God gives and we don't have to pay a thing. So um, I found that quite confusing, actually. But I grew up not wanting to be like that because... You know, it used to annoy me that every time I wanted to give her something, she didn't pay for it, you see. So we don't. Christ has paid the penalty. So it's, it's a very good lesson. So I had a bit of a confusing upbringing. But in my quick Christian walk, I learned it's not up to me to decide how much and who to give to. It wasn't conditional. If God gives me something and I am told to give it to someone else, then I must obey. Right. And how many, I don't know if you have any hoarding happening at your home. I was married to a hoarder and you never gave anything. You just kept it and it's a real marathon when you try and get rid of that. But when we look at God, he's an unconditional giver and we receive everything we need. There is not one thing we don't receive. And even in the end time, isn't it that we will receive food from ravens. We will be received, the angels will bring us and we'll receive a safety net with them. So it, it, God has everything under control. And when I'm looking a bit trapped, I remember that. I think, oh, this is a scary time. I think, no, God's going to look after us. He gives us everything we ever need. So we don't want to be a conditional giver. And that means we've got to walk very closely with Jesus every day. And if he says, give, you give. And even if it's your last penny, like the widow's mind, we give it unquestionably. It's a hard one because we've been brought up to be conditional. You know, make sure that uh, you know you, you hoard things and you survive. And, and yet survival is about giving, not receiving everything. It's an interesting concept. That's something when I look at the history, it's good to look at your history and see what did I learn. So now I receive so much in abundant ways that as I've got to know God, he gives, gives, gives. And at times I never know when, where or how, but it's a faith journey, isn't it? You know you need certain things and you don't know how it's going to happen or where it's coming from. But if you trust God, he will give and we receive. So he will provide all of our needs. And I find the more I receive from God, the more I receive um, in all aspects of my life, your life grows. Isn't this about sanctification? So, so this is a bit of a topic that's dear to my heart because in reality we need to give. Like we've just had an offering um, and how much do we give? Well, if God tells you how much to give, it's not a problem. If you're going, oh, I better not give that and I don't want to give that, and what if we're not allowing God to work in us? So let's explore a bit further the principle of receiving to give. So turn to Matthew 10 and we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. 
because there are some very good Bible verses that give us indicators of these principles. Matthew 10, and we're looking at verses 7 and 8. And again, a lot of verses I use you'll be familiar with. So Matthew 10, verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So we have to receive to give. Um, the expanded Bible, I sort of looked at some different verses in these things, and it says, I give you these powers freely, so help other people freely. Freely you have received, freely give. So if we stop looking at ourselves and what we're giving and look at God, look at Christ and allow the Spirit to work, then we will be able to freely give. We will have that power. So really, receiving to give is a belief and an attitude, and we're often looking at what we receive, um, not so much what we give. But where is your source of receiving? I go and work and the government gives me money and I receive it from the government. But what I do with it is up to God. Really, God's given it. God owns everything. He owns our house. He owns our money. He owns everything. And we forget that. We have this sense of ownership. So it's a belief or an attitude. And as you go and you walk with God, if you accept that he owns everything and he gives to us and we receive, then we'll know how to freely give. I think, again, it's that attitude we have. And it has to come from God's love in our heart. If we don't have God's love in our heart, I guarantee it won't happen. We will go to self. And this is one of the problems. Jesus asked us to do as he did. How did he get his power? And how often through his life on this earth? Every waking minute, every sleeping minute he had, his power came from his father. And he said, if you see me, you see the father. He relied on his father. He said, I can do nothing without him. Now, isn't that telling us we have to have the same belief, the same attitude? Now, we've got to remember it's free. It came with a price, the price to God, and Jesus was cross on the Calvary, was him dying on Calvary, wasn't it? But at the same time, if, if we have free, we're free. Grace is free. We're given it free. We don't have to do anything because Christ has paid the penalty. And I think we can be very ungrateful for that because we can receive what we receive is free. So being a creative <coughs> being, we need something outside of ourself, and that's what Christ's model was, and that, of course, is God, is his spirit. So what do we receive? We receive spiritual gifts, talents, money, health, etc., from God to give to others in abundance. So if you think, oh, I don't have anything to give, what does it take to give? What do you need? What have we received? If you've received a loving heart, you can give some poor person love. I don't care whether it's in the supermarket or be kind and loving towards them. It doesn't matter where it is. So have a look at what you've received. What gifts has God given you? you know, whether it be time, whether it be money. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be up there. You can do everything in your daily life. Look at what you've received. Now remember God is always other-centred. Right? So if he's other-centred, in other words, his focus is on everything outside of himself, not himself. That's what we have to be. And it's not until we have his spirit can that happen. And this is from the Desire of Ages 19.2. And it tells us, in the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own, in other words, it's not self-centered, has its source in the heart of God. Okay, so if we truly have, how do you know if someone really loves God is a true Christian, well, they won't be seeking their own means, their own source of anything. And we will know because they'll have God in their heart. You know, you, by their fruits, you will know them. And she says, what happened at Calvary is a law that was seen for life for all of earth and heaven, a lesson for all the universe. It's a law about love that doesn't seek its own that God has a group of people that doesn't seek its own, but only thinks of others. Is that what we want to be? We have to stop thinking of our own and thinking of others and say, oh, I'm too tired or I can't do this or it takes time. We've got to stop doing that. We have to look at not seeking our own. And she says, that is a lesson for the whole universe that God wants to see through us. That is the purpose of our existence. 
And isn't it when we get to be totally other-centred, there are enough people in that remnant that Christ will return? So it's up to us to do this. It's dependent on that. <laughs> so if we're not selfish and seek not our own, then we are freely receiving God's love. Take our focus <laughs> off ourselves and giving it to others. It's so easy to feel sorry for yourself. It's so easy to feel, oh, I feel really bad. What's wrong with me? And we come into self instead of going, hey, God's there. He's going to help me through this. You know, just sit with the way you feel, but don't buy into it. So this is where we can be free to receive God's love. And this is the sanctification process, and we have to die to self. <coughs> we have to be other-centred. Now, when you're born, kids, okay, we've got a couple of young people here. You're born what? Self-centred. A baby has to survive. It's going to cry and scream and carry on and get all the attention it wants, food or whatever. Now, as that baby grows and their brain and awareness grows, and particularly after about the age of two, what do they have to do? Start focusing. You want them to be caring and loving and stop thinking of themselves. It's a battle. You know, we, the young people here are probably still in that battle. I know we all are at times. So this is where we're born self-centred to survive, but we have to learn to be other centered and that is the challenge as you get older and what sort of world do we all live in a very selfish world western society is not about giving it's about receiving selfishly and keeping it all to yourself and it's a real power struggle now the great law of life is receiving god's love and when you look at that it's we to do that we need to look at the ten commandments the first four commandments are god-centered Right? And he's uh, directing us to have a relationship with him. And when we do that, we can keep the last six commandments, which are other-centred. None of it is self-centred. It's all about um, loving God and loving others. Now, if we are selfish and only want to take, not give, really it's about, we're like stealing from others, aren't we? We're taking, taking, taking. Then we become what we call narcissistic. And that's a term used a lot today. <coughs> And there are people with narcissistic personalities. A lot of them end up doing heinous crimes and end up in jail or whatever. And they're selfish, controlling, and want power over others. They would do everything to control other people. So the moment you go to want to control something or control others, that is narcissistic. In other words, it's self-serving. So we all have that tendency because that's the fallen nature. And what we want is to be able to give up power and control. Not easy. Each day, hand it over. When you take it back, hand it over. And this is where the battle is. And we know the devil wants us to not win that battle. He's there every inch of the way, but we are protected. When we walk with him, we are protected. Now, God's love is a basis of all true receiving and giving. And the term there, are, the Greeks have, the Greek have seven words that can outline love. First one, eros, and then there's a number which is about uh, friends love, family love, all these sorts of things. But the top level of love is what we call agape, A-G-A-P-E. And I think most of you would have heard of that. And that means God's love. Now, we don't have agape love. We have the other propensities to love, but not agape. It is unique to God. We don't produce it. So where are we going to get it from? Our source. So unless we go to that source, we cannot have God's love in our heart. And that means we've got to give up control, hand it over. And it sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's hard to do. It's a daily battle. So to be a giver of God's agape love, we have to receive it daily. So that means we've got to go. And this is where prayer and meditation and reading. And once we start giving our heart to others, we've got agape love there. So looking each day to see what can I give? Who can I help? Who can I call? A lot of people may be here on their own. What can I do? There's lots of avenues. Now, as we know, unfortunately, the devil keeps us busy in this world. We get distracted. We can get bogged down emotionally. Uh, we start keeping, hoarding, keeping things instead of giving with God's agape love. And the instant you turn it around, difference is huge. I find I can be caught in things and looking, oh, what's going to happen? And why hasn't God answered that prayer? And look at what happened today and then when I'm doing that what's my 
uh, emotional being doing is going down that hill feeling either anxious or depressed. The moment I give it to God and the moment I hand it over, there's a lifting up. Even if not, I find that depression or that anxiety eventually dissipates, but it's not the intensity and control it has if I am connected to it and I'm thinking it. So really it's a battle of the mind. It's what we're doing in the mind that is important and that's where we receive. We've got the conscience and we've got the will in the mind and that's where we receive. So we have to open that mind and receive. And this is why what we do and what we think is powerful. Now, a biblical story of the, is a parable that explains some of this is the parable of the wealthy fool. And I'm not going to look at it, but it's in Luke 12. It's too, you know, too much to read here, 13 to 21. But I think most of you know that um, the parable of the wealthy fool in Luke 12, uh, if anyone wants to look it up, 13 to 21, talks about him storing in his barn, storing grain, just massive amounts of storing. So he could have a life of wealth and ease. Right? So what was he doing? He was hoarding. He was keeping it all for himself. Um, and it shows us the futility of believing that wealth can secure prosperity or a good life. So he kept building bigger and bigger barns. He didn't, wasn't happy with what he had. And uh, he was self-serving and self-centered. It was all about him. You know, and he's looking at his future. How many people do that today? You know, and how many people even here have lost all their savings or all of their super fund because there's a, the famous crashes that occur and we just lose everything. I know people on the coast from millionaires to living in their car. You know, that's how powerful we can be. So really, we have nothing, own nothing, and we can rely on God. And he will look after you even in those times. This was an interesting comment I found from St. Augustine, and he commented on this parable. He said that the farmer was planning to fill his soul with excessive and unnecessary feasting and was proudly disregarding all those empty bellies of the poor. He did not realise that the bellies of the poor were much safer storerooms than his barns. Wow. Isn't that a, a great... Uh, it is. You know, if we want to have a storeroom, keep giving because God will bless and it, it is enriched. And um, you know, like when we pray over it, the money we collect, it will be taken and used bountifully. So this is a lesson for us not to have greed and hoarding mentality. And remember, it's a belief up here, like that wealthy fool, but to give freely from what we receive from God through Christ, through the Spirit, and not worry about the future. I don't know how many here have anxiety disorders. I know the moment I start worrying about the future, about money or what's happening, mm -hmm. guess what? I get anxious because it's future fear. Mm -hmm. So we have to come back to the Lord. And in the Bible it says, be anxious for nothing. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You have enough to be anxious about today. You don't need to be worrying about what is going to happen. And this is where, why when we receive the word, when we read the word, which is our manna from heaven on a daily basis, we are reminded of these principles and it helps us to stop looking at ourselves. Now, receiving God's love is the true basis of all giving. So what's the primary thing we need to receive? Not just he blesses us with money or goods. We, re we need to receive his love. And this is a comment uh, by a Christian by the name of uh, Larry James. And he's looking at giving in love. Um, as a Christian. He says, giving is a spiritual principle that enables the giver to receive. Many non-Christian people have used the universal principle of giving and receiving. And because the power in giving always works when applied, anyone can receive. So that means Christians and non-Christians receive. The difference is what we do with it. However, only the Christian believer partners with the creator of the principle. Giving and receiving are part of the natural flow of life. And God as our Father can inspire us in love to further benefit our lives and the lives of those our gifts touch. And I find when you have that thing of giving, and we give even when we don't have a lot, doesn't it? It's not amount, it's, it's the attitude and what we do. God blesses. And I'm just amazed. The more I give money away, the more I seem to get. You know, this thing, and I have people I know, a lady who's struggling, she's, oh no, don't need to tithe. It's not, it's Old Testament. So you get all these reasons why, and then she's stressed about money and it's disappearing, and I've explained to her, no, the more you give, the more God gives back. And you can't see where from. You know, I think, well, hang on, where is this money I'm here going to come from? It comes from the most unlikely sources. Um, 
and I've got lots of testimonies of that, unexpected amounts that come in. Um, so, yeah, we've got to take our focus off what we don't have and put on what we do have and look at what God will give us. He will give us abundantly. He wants to. He wants to bless us. He wants to give good gifts to his children. So the Bible always gives us insight and understanding on any of the topics we look at. So turn to Luke 6, verse 8. I've got several um, looks here at different verses, but we'll do the King James. So we're Luke 6, verse 8. Is there any different um, wordings of this that give us the principle we want? So it says in Luke 6, verse 8, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And uh, the Amplifier says, given it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, with no space left for more. So that means we are filled abundantly. With the standard of measurement you use, when you do good to others, it will be measured to you in return. So the more we do good to others, and that's like giving money to help people or whatever, the more we're giving in return. It might not be in money, but it will be in goods we need. How often if you're giving something away, and next thing it comes back to you in another way. This, this is the principle. And the um, expanded Bible says about what we will give, it will be that, that cup that fills up, will be running over that will spill into your lap. The image is of grain overflowing its container. Isn't that a lovely image? So this is where... Um, what we give in good measure will be running over, it will be abundant. So if we only take and don't <coughs> give, we give selfishly, then how can God bless us? He can't. So this is our self-monitoring on a daily basis. I want to give this. Am I doing it because I want something in return? Mm. You know, people say, I'm a good giver. You know, and in the end, Christ will say, I don't know you, but I gave to the poor and I did this. Mm. But it's what it has to come from the heart of God in your heart. It's not enough for us to say, well, I'm doing it like the legalistic side, give, 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 and then expect a blessing. I think when we give, we need to not expect a blessing, and it comes in amazing ways. And we must remember it is much better to give than to receive. This is Ellen White, the Acts of the Apostles, page 342.2 points out. The Apostle Paul in his ministry among the churches was untiring in his efforts to inspire in the hearts of the new converts a desire to do large things for the cause of God. Often he exhorted them to exercise the exercise of liberality. And in speaking to the elders of Ephesus of his former labors among them, he said, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. So turn to Acts 20, 35. We're going to have a look at that one. And... Then we're going over to Corinthians. So Acts 20.35, because this reading then goes on and uses this verse. So I thought we'll just use, we'll go to the verses. And it's about being better to give than receive. So Acts 20.35, I've showed you all things, how that so labouring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Right? And it's interesting, the expanded Bible pointed out this is a saying of Jesus not recorded elsewhere in Scripture. It's one of those one-off things, but it's a very important principle. And if you have a look at 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, and we'll do verse 7 as well, two verses there. And it says, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every morn, man according to as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, but God loveth a cheerful giver. So one of my principles, if I can't do it with God's love cheerfully, don't give it all. It's worse to do that. Pray that God will give you the generosity and the love to give cheerfully. And often people are very surprised. It's interesting. 
you know, people and people say, oh, no one's ever done that for me before. And it opens their heart. But what's it opening their heart to? God's love in you. <coughs> they will be attracted to that. And then this is when you can be a witness. So we need to have an open heart and to give thoughtfully, purposefully, generously and bountifully. We mustn't be grudging and do it reluctantly or compulsively. How often do we have, oh, I always give to that, but we do it thoughtlessly. We need to give it, be cheerful and give it with purpose. Okay. In fact, it's better not to give if we have that attitude. And the Amplified Bible put the part of that that says, God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. So put your heart in your gift. We're coming up to this Christmas time, which we know is just a worldly pagan process, but we can give. We can, we've got so much, can't we give? You know, and show people we're givers, not receivers at this point of time. And do it with delight in your heart, do it generously. So what are some of the positive outcomes of receiving so much from our loving Heavenly Father to give to others? And I found an interesting article with six biblical scientific reasons why it's better to give than to receive because it is actually good for us in many ways but the first one was giving reflects God's character and we've talked about that through throughout today because God is a giver he's got a giving nature remember it's his agape love and that is his character it's not just love it reflects who God is so, and in giving us his son to die for us on the cross, we, I mean, could we do that? Could we do that? It's, it's, it's a huge ask, isn't it, to give up something like that that you love and give it uh, knowing it's going to die. So we give because God gave. Giving is one way we reflect God's character. Now, how come you give so much? How come you're generous in your giving are some of the comments you'll get? Because people don't do that nowadays. Say, well, I know, I've had people say, oh, how come you do that for me? No one else does. I said, well, God does a lot of things for me and I like to share it around. And they're not Christians necessarily, but they're getting a picture of, hey, God's a giver. And the other one, giving is commanded. That was an interesting one. And there, this uh, writer listed a number of things. And this was in Deuteronomy 15. But the, 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 end, the verse 11 says, For the poor will never cease from the land, therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. So at that point, we were commanded. And that was Deuteronomy 15, verses 10 and 11. I was talking about giving to your poor brother. So it's, um, and again, it says in 10, give freely and generously, right? Has to come from the heart. Not to be resentful was another one. And do it in all your undertakings. And then it says it as a commandment. So it's important that we do that. Number three was giving makes you happy. Aren't you happy when you give? Unless you're giving grudgingly. How often have you given? So oh, I wish I hadn't given that away. I might need it one day. How often do we do that one? That was one of the catchphrases. No, you don't give it away. You might need it one day. Well, hang. I'll go to the op shop and get another one. <laughs> or someone will give it to you. God will provide. You know, this is a trusting thing. It's a, and we all want to be happy. You know, it's actually an addiction. Everyone's doing everything to make them happy, and they're not really living the right life. Okay. Again, it comes back to happiness as a belief and attitude we have. Um, and it, it's, uh, we're hardwired um, initially to give. We were created in God's image, but that's changed over time. And there's a lot of scientific studies that show giving makes you happy. Right? And it's, in this one, studies have shown when you spend relatively more on someone else, it reduces depression and creates a warding experience. I find when I have clients who are depressed, I get them to go and do volunteer work. Do something nice for someone tomorrow and then tell me what it is. Write it down. And look, it's amazing. They're sticking out of themselves and their poor misery pit of depression. Oh, I'm so sad and life's awful and no one cares. And get all this rhetoric going on and I just, okay, we've got to get out of that one. And because the desire to give is rooted in our very being, when we have Christ in our heart, we cannot help but be a happy giver. So we have the propensity to give, and Christ will activate it. But what does Satan do? He'll shut it down. He'll make you not want to give. And four, giving makes you healthier, and that's in body, soul, and spirit, and it gives us a longer life expectancy. And some of the research shows on generous people tend to be healthier. 
And some of the positive benefits they find, generous people who give a lot from the heart and are healthier, lower blood pressure, reduced stress, increased life expectancy, lower risk of dementia, less anxiety and reduced heart disease. Isn't that a good list? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there we go. So be generous and happy giving. So, um, and also then of course, we'll be exercising nutritional foods to include, we've got a health message there in giving to others because we need the energy to do it. Number five, giving expresses your trust in God because God is our source and provider from the air we breathe to the water we drink, to the food that you grow, to everything. We often forget that we take it for granted. And these were just principles and I won't go through or won't read each one, but if you want to go, you'll know it, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, where God dresses the lilies of the field and does all that. He knows what you need. He knows you need food. He knows you need water. He knows you need shelter. He knows you need clothes. So do you think he's going to not provide? Of course, he will provide. So, and this is where, as we're giving, it expresses our faith and trust in God. You know, and if you give some, well, what will happen for you if you're going to give that to me? No, God will provide. This is, again, you can be a witness to people. So I want you to go out and practice giving to people, not because you want them to respond, but use it as a way of being a witness, of showing God's love because you've received, you give it. Where do we have? We get it from God first, don't we? Where do I receive money from? Not the government. God sets it up for me. So if I get it, then I can give it. And I have people who are a bit horrified at the money I'll give when they know because they don't understand. The more I give, the more I get. And I keep telling them that God is good. So we're a witness. Ask and you will receive as God will give you the grace you need to become a generous giver. So we can always give. I'm sure you've got things at home or just time. People say, no one spends time with me. I have people who are depressed because there's no friends around, no good friends. And they find a friend who usually doesn't look after them and then they don't want friends. So we're all a nice, kind, caring friends. And as Christians, we need to do that. And this is in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7. And I'm just reading this from the Amplified. It says, But just as you excel in everything and lead the way in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in genuine concern, and in your love for us, see that you excel in this gracious work of giving also. So we're asked to excel in it. And excel means to do the best. That was 2 Corinthians 8, 7. And different versions, of course, give you different perspectives on a verse, but um, most of them are uh, telling us and giving expansions of, of what the verse is saying. So number six, giving advances the kingdom of God. So giving is far more than just money, okay? So what we receive from God, we need to give to be a witness to him. Yeah, and it works. And what do we give? Not just money, time, goods. We give everything. Give of ourself yeah, and give generously. Give some love and caring to others who really need it. Now, remember Acts 20, 35 emphasise it's more blessed to give than to receive and then we're being told to be a um, cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. Now, if you give away cheerfully, it makes a big difference. And by the grace of God, we need to strive to reflect his generous character by being a generous giver. Because when we do that, we're um, reflecting God's character and it's other-centred. We must remember that. There are some good principles I find are helpful in my daily walk. And one is when I'm getting caught up in things, am I being other-centred? Ask yourself, am I other-centred like God or am I self-centred like Satan? So I said, just good. They're, it's good. They're just like two dichotomies, I guess you could say, but uh, that's what happens. So turn to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 7 as we are going to wind up here. I mean, there's lots more we could say or share, but you can do a good search on it. And go into your Bible and have a look. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 6 and 7. Right. Starting at verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness <coughs> shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels at the ex of us, the principle of giving. This is um, verse 7 from the Amplified says, but we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation in un un 
worthy earthen vessels of human frailty, which is what we are, so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, his sufficiency and not from ourselves. So remember, we have to receive to give and God will give us abundantly. We will receive abundantly. We can't just sit with it. We can't be like that uh, wealthy young ruler. We can't just keep storing it. We have to bless others with it. Isn't that the principle? And, you, and that's when you become the cheerful giver. So this is on a final note. And this is from Christ's Object Lessons, page 61. It says, in our divine life, we shall be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. We shall no longer live the common life of selfishness, but Christ will live in us. His character will be reproduced in our nature. Isn't that when we can truly receive to give? So have a think about it and look at ways you can give. Because we need Jesus to come back and we can't be ready because mm. as you receive from God and give and then you give generously, it's sanctifying you. It's taking out the that part of us that we don't need, the selfish part, the part of us that um, God wants to purify. So the sooner we do this, and it's a great way to do it, the sooner I believe Jesus will return. Thank you. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we take the simplicity of the principles we've learned today and be able to receive abundantly from you and give abundantly and be cheerful in this to be a witness for you and help people to see what a, a loving, giving, <coughs> wonderful <coughs> saviour you really are. Help us to stand on your promises and prepare for <coughs> the time that when you will return for us and help us to be joyful givers and um, what we receive. We thank you for your many blessings and the love that you've shown us and give us in Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.